at verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a seat, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even of those which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, <clears throat> a holy nation, a peculiar people. Ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil do doers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of salvation. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him, must worship in spirit and truth. Let's now sing the song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Uh. 
So the title's usually the last thing that I do when I'm studying, and unfortunately, I came up with it yesterday, so that's why it's not on the slide, because um, I, don't, I don't make uh, Carrie, our PowerPoint guy, work on Saturdays, or at least try not to. Um, but the title for today's message is Real Conflict, Real Conflict, from James chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. But I have a question for you as we get started. Uh, Does this ever happen in your home? Somebody brings up a question that no one really knows the answer to. So inevitably, somebody throws out what they think is an answer, and then somebody else throws out what they think the answer is. And multiple people then immediately begin to pull out their phones, and begin to look up what the answer is. I don't know if that happens in your home. It happens in ours, and I'm the one that's notorious for pulling out my phone and checking and making sure that I'm right. Or maybe you have a question that's posed to you that you don't really want to know the answer to. Like, you do know what a hot dog's made out of, don't you? And you might say, I, I don't want to know the answer to that question. Uh, let's just move on from here, right? Or maybe uh, I had, a, had a, a teacher in middle school who was famous for saying the phrase, I don't even want to know. Um, for instance, in junior high, I remember um, a kid bringing in, he would always bring a yogurt in for lunchtime. And I was in a small Christian school, so we didn't have like a lunchroom or anything. We just kind of sat in our classrooms and ate. And our teacher was at her desk up at the front, and we always had this kid. He always brought a yogurt in every day. And classic middle schooler thing, you would, you would, he would always open up and peel that lid off the yogurt. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but the, the yogurt kind of just plops like a bunch of yogurt on you, which is like every yogurt when you peel the lid off, right? But it's a classic middle schooler thing. And, and one day this kid, his yogurt, he peeled it, and for some reason, there was just a bunch on the lid, and it just went all over. I mean, it, was, it exploded on his face and on his arms and his pants. It's all over his desk. And I remember Mrs. Huber, our teacher, just looking up from her lunch with the most disgust ever, with the biggest eye roll you've ever seen, and says, I don't even want to know what just happened, because he created this huge mess. Questions come up all the time that we either don't know the answer to or that sometimes we don't want to know the answer to that question, but rather we'd, re- we'd, we'd like to turn a blind eye to whatever the answer to that question is. And in our passage today, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, the pastor in Jerusalem, brings up a question that although many want to know the answer, they typically don't really want to when they hear what the answer is. Because it's something that hits home, it's something that hits the heart. That's where we're going to be this morning. And if you remember from two weeks ago, Pastor Kyle was in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and which says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The theme is unity here in Ephesians chapter 4. And in keeping with the theme of unity, that's why I wanted to go to James chapter 4 this morning. Because we're going to talk about unity, but Paul takes on unity from a very positive angle in Ephesians chapter 4, a very encouraging angle, whereas James in chapter 4 takes a very negative angle. Uh, You could almost think of it this way. Paul in Ephesians 4 is kind of like the good cop. Uh, he's encouraging you, he's, you know, riling you up to, to get you to, to do this in a very encouraging way, and James is kind of the bad cop coming in in James chapter 4, looking to rough you up a little bit and make you understand that this is really serious, and you need to know this answer. So let's look at James chapter 4, 
And if I will read verses 1 through 10 for us. James says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and you can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose for that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Our main idea this morning is this. Lives that are ravaged by conflict are lives that are resistant to God. Lives ravaged by conflict are lives resistant to God. Let's pray, and then we will begin to work through this text. Father, we thank you for your word. It is truth. It is pure. It is honest. And it is shocking on many occasions. Lord, your word shakes us to our core. Your, your word challenges us in the deepest recesses of our heart and shows us what we are. So I pray this morning that you would give us wisdom, that you would give me wisdom to preach, and Lord, that your word would go forth and that it would not return void. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I'll give you a moment. Because I know being on the receiving end, some of you are writing down the main idea right now because we just prayed. So I'll give you a moment. But our, our main idea is lives ravaged by conflict are lives resistant to God. And just to give you a little background, because we, we haven't been in James. Maybe some of you have been reading it on your own. Um, but to understand kind of where we are, James in his letter at this point has been focusing on the idea that certain actions spring from certain people. He's been talking about the tongue primarily in chapter 3, and he's been illustrating that the fruit of one thing can't contradict its own nature. So even if if you flip over to chapter 3, he gives multiple illustrations and says in verse 11, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Things can't produce something that is contrary to its nature. So therefore, believers should produce blessing and good things from their mouth, not cursing and vile things, because that's not who believers are. And the same can be said for those who are wise, and that's where he goes in verse 13 of chapter 3. Wise people do wise things. And in the context of the unity in the church, this means that godly wisdom produces peace, it produces mercy, it produces gentleness among believers, whereas earthly wisdom produces jealousy, it produces selfish ambition, produces all kinds of disorder. And so from here, at this point in the letter, James 
asks a really simple question in his letter. And so look with me at point number one, the source of our conflict, the source of our conflict. James asks his question, so what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Where does the disunity come from? Where does the disorder come from? That, that word, what causes, is literally, he's saying, from where? From where do quarrels come from? Or, or maybe you have a translation that says, from where do wars come from? And where do fightings come from among you? He's talking about what is the origin? What is the source of the conflict that you are experiencing right now? And he says that what is the cause or from where do these quarrels and fights come from that are among you? It's not between unbelievers and believers. James is writing to believers here. And understandably, you would know that that unbelievers and believers would probably have some differences of values, of perspectives, of a worldview. But James says there are wars, quarrels, fights. These words can stem from anything from verbal action to physical altercations. He says, where are they coming from among you, believers? The human answer, right, in our mind, would be, well, the source of conflict, the source of problems comes from those people out there. Right? It's, you know, it, it's if only, you know, this person would just understand. Or if this person would just, you know, not annoy me so much. Or if my wife or if my husband would, would just get it and, and, and help me out here. Or if my kids would just understand that, you know, it's, it's not helpful to be running around and helpful to be really loud all the time. Or if this other person would just, would just get that they're the issue. It's not me. We look at others. Or maybe we look at our environment that we're in. Well, you just don't understand um, the way I grew up. Or you don't understand the, you know, the, the workplace that I'm in and the amount of pressure that I'm under Or you don't understand the financial situation that our family is in, and it's causing all of these problems. And sometimes we point the finger at the environment that we're living in. Or sometimes we even give the excuse or or we point the finger at, well, that's just, you know, that's just naturally who I am. I'm I'm just an angry person. And so, you know, it's just going to come out. It's it's not me. And, And we often even disassociate our personality from ourselves, like it's its own entity that's working, you know, outside of how we can control it. These are the human answers that we typically give. But James's answer is very different. He says, from where do quarrels, from where do fights come among you? Is it not this? That your passions are at war within you. He takes that finger that's pointing to everything else and he turns it back in to us. It's not anyone else's problem. It's not anyone else's concern. It's not the environment that you're in. We have to take ownership for our own hearts. And he says the word passions here. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? What does he mean by this? Passions here really means just an intense pleasure or enjoyment. Um, but at this point in the language, there's, there's pretty much a connotation of the word lusts, something a little bit more negative. And even in verse 2, James uses the word you desire and do not have. It's a similar word. It doesn't have to be negative. But more than likely, James is using this to imply a strong and unhealthy craving to secure something that's not currently your own. Essentially, it is a desire, it's a, it's a, it's a passion, it's a want, 
that is out of control. It's brought to a level that is unhealthy. It's taking the place of good desires. We all don't, we don't understand what that is, right? If you're like me, uh, you have a desire to win. And I know from being here for two years that there's other people who have that desire in this room, have that competitive drive to win, or at least just to not lose. That's not a bad desire in and of itself. It gives drive, right? But it becomes a bad desire if it's taken to an unhealthy level. And I have to win at all costs. Doesn't matter who gets in my way, they're getting run over, right? We understand that passions can get out of control. That desires, although they may be good, they may be fine in and of themselves, can be taken to an unhealthy level. And these passions and desires that James is talking about really can be for anything. It can be a desire for control, a desire just for pleasure, a desire for security, a desire for wealth and resources, a desire for love, to be loved or to love someone. All of these are fine desires in and of themselves, but we all know when those desires are taken to an unhealthy level and they become out of control. And James is saying, that's the source of your problem. When passions are taken to an unhealthy level, it means that we are willing to do anything and trample anyone to satisfy that passion or desire. We have to have it. I have to be comfortable. And whoever gets in my way will not feel comfort. I have to feel secure. I have to feel satisfied and have pleasure in my life. I have to have things and wealth and resources in order for me to feel comfortable. I have to be loved by people. And when that's taken to a level that is unhealthy, that replaces a desire for God, then that desire usually takes the place of what James gives us a progression in verse 2. These become what James says are, are worldly passions, or if you look in chapter 3, he calls it worldly wisdom. That's where jealousy and selfish ambition and all of these bad attitudes and bad motives come from. Because their source is selfishness. And selfishness is the primary attitude and value of the world. So he says in verse 2, you desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. It's these unfettered passions that lead us to conflict. And James uses very strong, very intense, very emotionally charged language throughout this entire passage. You can see it in verse 1 you, when he talks about wars and fightings. You can see it in verse 2 when he says you desire and don't have so you murder. Now, I don't think that, that that's probably literal. If it is, talk about a dysfunctional church. But I think he's using emotionally charged language because it is true, but these passions are so out of control that people are being hated. People are being despised. The attitude within the heart is just as evil as the outward sin. James was around Jesus may have even heard Jesus preach parts of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus equates an inner sin to be the same as the external sin, where he says that hating your brother is committing murder, or where he says that lusting after a woman in your heart is committing adultery. James is getting at the same point here. Your passions are out of control and you don't and you can't satisfy them 
So people become the target. And brothers and sisters, what we have to understand is that there is a nature inside of us that is constantly wanting to be at war with those around us. Because we want certain things. And as James is going to say, when we don't go to God for those things, then people end up in the wake of our destruction. James is trying to get his audience to wake up to something that they need to take care of. They need to feel the weight of this problem. He continues to just use this strong language in verse 4, in verse 8, in verse 9, because he, has, he wants to get them to understand the seriousness of this issue. Their problem is that their passions are out of control. And their passions are reigning over them as God's children. Where God should be reigning over them, they are letting their passions reign over them. And obviously James is speaking in the context of the church here. But this passage can easily be applied to any relationship among believers. To marriages, to families, to friendships. And we say when James gives us this answer that it's the passions that are inside of you, those, that's what's coming out and it's causing the conflict in your life, we say, well, I get that. Some of you who have grown up in church or who have been a believer for a long time or have been reading your Bible fairly well, you, you know that answer. But then why do we wonder what the issue is in our marriage when things seem to be falling apart? Why can we not find the answer? We wonder what's wrong with our family when everyone is at each other's throats all the time. We wonder what could be the problem when gossip and strife and disunity are occurring in the church among believers. And it's like, we don't understand. We don't get it. How could that have happened? What we do is we tend to look out the window when conflict comes to a head, at everything else but us, rather than first looking in the mirror, which is part of what James says in his letter, that the word of God is a mirror to show you what you are and don't go away unchanged from it. This isn't to say that maybe the conflict we're experiencing with someone is always our own personal fault, but how often do we point the finger first rather than examining ourselves and seeing what desires am I allowing to control me? What is going on in my heart, in my life that is causing disunity, that is causing problems, that is causing conflict? Because the universal truth that we need to understand is what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, 20 to 23. He says our heart uh, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from without. It's everybody else. No, he says they come from within and they defile a person. Sin originates from within, not from without. Our hearts are bent towards sin and just waiting for an opportunity to be selfish. So why do we wonder when things are falling apart? We know the problem. And James has given us the answer here in, in verses one through two, but it's part of the answer he gives another part of the answer in verse 3. James, kind of like a doctor, just continues to diagnose the problem, continues to show them and write out for them, here's what your issue is, and you can do with it what you need to do, but here's where your conflict is coming from. And so look at verse, uh, the second half of verse 2 into verse 3 with me. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask 
and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Part of the source of the problem is either the deficiency in asking or in the dishonesty of our asking. James says you're not tapping into a resource that you have, Almighty God. You're not asking Him. And maybe it is, even for us today, that, that we, why, why is prayer, why is going to God always a second thought? Why is it always an afterthought for us? Why is it something that we typically don't tend to run to first thing? James has already been teaching in his letter. And if you're familiar with the book of James, you'll know that in chapter 1, verse 5, God gives wisdom to those that ask of him, and he gives it generously. He gives it liberally. God is the giver of every good gift in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. And James teaches to go to God for help. So why is it an afterthought for us? Why when we're having problems and we're having struggles with people, do we have to find it inside of ourselves? Or we feel like we can do it on our own and try to resolve the issue. You don't have in the passions that that you're looking to accomplish and to achieve and to obtain for yourself, you don't have because you don't ask. You're not being satisfied because you're not going to God about the things that you desire. And then James says, even for those, he almost anticipates them saying, well, I am asking, I am praying. I I do want to seek God's help. And he says, well, you don't uh, obtain, or sorry, you, um, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. It's not okay, it's not proper for believers to use God as a vending machine for self-gratification. And we think that I, I, you know, we go to God and we, we enter in the, I've read my Bible today or for the last week or the last month or I've been going to church consistently or, and we plug in, I've been praying to him or I've been serving in the church or I've been doing all of these good things and I've been on my best behavior and we put it in and then we punch in the number and we expect for that thing that we want to just immediately come out. And we end up using God as a vending machine for whatever thing that we want. That is not what prayer is. Prayer is a relationship that we commune with God through this means. We build a relationship with him. We go to God and maybe it's a desire that we have for comfort or a desire that we have for security or you know, we really need something in our life. And God can is the one who can give that desire or, and maybe you've experienced this in prayer, change that desire, mold that desire because it's not quite the right desire. And prayer even almost acts as a cleansing agent for our desires and for our souls when we actually come to God and we seek his wisdom, not our own wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Prayer is the opportunity to talk to someone who can both fix your problems and shape your desires so that there will be less problems. But why don't we go to him? Why is it an afterthought? Both of these uses of prayer are part of the problem for our conflict. And James next in verse 4 makes a very bold and very intense claim about the people's unwillingness to see the problem of their selfishness. It's much more serious than they are willing to admit. And so look with me at verse 4 at the seriousness of our conflict. The seriousness of our conflict. James comes right out the gate in verse 4 and says, You adulterous people, Exclamation point. 
You adulterous people, James is using a very familiar concept to those who are readers of the Old Testament of God's idolatrous people being compared to an unfaithful spouse. It's this, this picture is used constantly throughout the, the Old Testament prophets. And so as James says this and uses this term for his readers, that's what they're thinking about. That what they are doing in their idolatry, in their selfishness, is they are being unfaithful to God like an unfaithful spouse, breaking that covenant as his children, as his bride. And so James brands them with a term for used for God's people when they would selfishly flaunt their idol worship while claiming to worship God. This is serious. When we go about our Christian lives, when we walk out our faith, but yet cling to these desires that we have, rather than God, we are acting like unfaithful spouses to him. When we flaunt these selfish desires and we seek them and we, we look to gain them at whatever cost, this is a reflection of who we are. And so James points out to his audience that they don't really understand a simple biblical concept. And so in verse 4 he says, You adulterous people, do you not know? Don't you understand that friendship with the world is is enmity with God. Those two things are equated. If you are a friend of the world, it means that you are an enemy of God. There is no middle ground. There is no in-between. There is no I can serve God and my passions and the world because that's what it means to be a friend of the world. It means that we adopt the same values, the same worldview. We adopt the same actions and attitudes and the things that we seek Being a friend of the world is sharing and pursuing the world's selfish values. And it's being an enemy of God. It's plain and simple. There's no getting around it. So if your behavior towards other people is characterized by manipulation, by control, by stepping on others, by insults, gossip, strife, and pursuing whatever selfish goal you have to get what you want, then you have made yourself an enemy of God. You are resistant to him in your pride. You are a child of God, but are acting as one who is unregenerate. You're in an adulterous relationship with the world and have betrayed God. This is how serious James wants us to see our sin of selfishness around others. It is an affront to God. It is an offense to God. And all that he is, he has not sanctified you. He has not saved you for this kind of a lifestyle where you seek to fulfill whatever passions that are inside of you and living like the world. But God has given you everything you need to fight those passions. So in verse 5, James wants his readers to understand the seriousness of their sin. That it's actually not necessarily a problem that's revolving around other people, but it's a problem that's revolving between us and God. And in verse 5, James is going to cite Proverbs 3.34 to just to prove his statement that acting on selfish desires makes us an enemy of God. And he kind of makes three points within these citations here. So in verse 5 he says, Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what three points is he kind of trying to make here? One, from verse five, 
is that God cares how we act as his people. God is not just some person who has saved us and then just lets us go and doesn't care how we behave or doesn't care how we act or doesn't care how we bear his name in this world. God cares very much how we act as his people. God is jealous for what he has created, both just as being a human being and carrying his image, and as well being a believer, being one of his children, being a part of his family, and the new life in you that he has created. And because of that, he will chastise those that he loves, and he teaches us and humbles us. And some of you have experienced that chastening. We were talking with friends Friday night that God's chastening is really annoying sometimes. And that it seems like even there's times when the same thing kind of keeps happening because God's trying to continue to teach us the same lesson over and over and over again that we aren't getting. I mean, there's a reason why I tore both my left ACL when I was a senior in high school and my right ACL 10 years later. God needed to teach me patience. God needed to teach me things and chastise me for how selfish I was being in my desires. And maybe that's happened to you. But God cares very much how we act, how we live out our lives. And then he makes two further points. He says that God will oppose those who choose pride and that God will give grace to those who choose humility. So even after, as a child of God, as a believer, when when God chastises you, but you still choose pride, God will oppose you, will resist you because of that pride. But if you choose humility, then so much grace is given to you. And this is where The greatness of God is on display in this passage and the beauty of the gospel is that even in our rebellion and even after we've become believers, but we're pursuing this passion and pursuing this selfish ambition and pursuing this need that we just need to satisfy in our craving and betraying God all the while, if we choose humility, God gives a greater grace. He gives more grace when we come to him in humility. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve that at all. But the greatness of God is that despite our behavior and our unfaithfulness, he gives a greater, a more extraordinary grace to any who humble themselves. And this humility is exactly where James goes to next. You'll notice Even in this next section, so the the back half of verse 6 all the way down through verse 10, that it's bookended by the idea of God's grace given to the humble. So you see at the end of verse 6, and then if you look down at verse 10, James says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humility is the primary attitude of this next section. And the answer for a life that is ravaged by conflict. And what James is going to do is he rattles off about 10 imperatives to if, if you want to take that relationship that you have made yourself an enemy of God by pursuing the worldly passions that are within you and making war on other people, you can humble yourself before the Lord and grace can be given. And you can remedy that friendship with God and remedy the ailment of friendship with the world and the conflict that we find ourselves in. So lastly, let's look at the solution for our conflict. The solution for our conflict in verse 7. We want to, in this section, just for sake of time, understand what James means by each command, but we're not going to spend an exhaustive amount of time on these. We could spend a lot of time going through each of these imperatives and all the implications. Um, And maybe that's a plug for tonight. We'll do a little bit of that tonight in our application. 
But what are these 10 imperatives that he gives? Right off the bat in verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. James grounds submission to God on the guarantee of God's nature. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's who God is. So therefore, submit yourselves to God. Don't continue on in pride and selfishness and thinking that you are going to accomplish anything. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. The idea here, because submission is a really loaded term in our culture today, the idea here is to allow yourself to be subjected to God. It's ordering our lives under his authority and his will for them. It is obeying his commands and not our own desires. It's taking everything about us and and putting it under what God wants for us. And his desires, his will, his authority bearing down on us and living in that position. James says, submit yourself to God. And this is a really... Simple thing, but it is not easy. It's a simple thing. Submit yourself to God. We understand what that means, but it's not an easy thing to do. Because, brothers and sisters, it's, it's so much more comfortable to just stay in our pride. It's so much more easy to just blame others for the problems that we have or to continue in our sin and resistance to God. That is the easy place to be. That is the comfortable place to be. And so it's going to take a lot on your part to submit, to humble yourself before God. James says to submit yourselves therefore to God and then he says resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is more a result of this submission to God because if you are submitting to God, if you're subjecting yourself to God, then naturally you're going to be resisting the devil. James has already said that these two things are mutually exclusive, right? If you are a friend of the world, then you're an enemy of God. So if you submit yourself to God and make yourself a friend of God, then you're going to be resisting the devil. You're going to be resisting God the worldly passions and the worldly values that Satan rules over. So when we submit to God, we are also resisting the devil. And as we align ourselves under God, the result is this growing resistance to temptations of the devil to the point where James says, when you resist him, he will flee from you. He loses a foothold in your life and has to flee So submit to God, resist the devil, and then verse 8, draw near to God. James calls for us to move towards God and God will reciprocate. Now, I, I want you to understand that if you're a believer today, God is not far away. God is not far away. If you are a believer this morning, if you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But there are times in our lives Even as we sang this morning in Come Now Found, there are times that we wander as his children. There are times that we wander away as sheep. And James says, draw near to God, and you better believe that he is going to reciprocate that. He will be there. The same verb is used for both our action and God's response. And throughout, what's interesting throughout James's letter Drawing near to God for James is not simply just a mental or emotional response. It's a practical one. It's not just, all right, draw near to God. Think really hard. I need to, I need to just have this attitude about me. It's a really practical thing throughout the book of James. James talks about controlling our tongue as part of submission to God in chapter 1, verse 19, 26. Chapter 3, verse 2, James talks about caring for the poor. James talks about growing in wisdom and in peace, about communing with God in prayer. It's not just a mental exercise. 
to draw near to God. It's something that we live out. The point is, drawing near to God is not just a mental or, or an emotional thing. It is a consistent, practical walk with God, living in his wisdom, living in the way that God meant our lives to be lived. The more we seek to walk with God and live according to his wisdom, the closer we will grow to his purity and holiness. The more we will reflect God, the more we will begin to actually act like his children and not his enemy. So James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, just helping them to remember the position they're in. That they're sinners before God. That they are a double-minded people where they are serving their own passions and their own lusts on one hand and then turning around and saying, I serve God on the other. And so James says what you need to do, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. And he's using simple metonymy for those of you who are grammar nerds. Um, or, or poetry nerds, I guess. Um, which is that he's using hands, he's using hearts to symbolize something greater that they represent. Hands, it's not that James is talking to them to go out and just wash your hands and cleanse them. He's talking about external actions that you are doing. So cleanse your hands the external actions that you are doing, and then purify your heart, those internal attitudes, those selfish desires that you've been living in. These point to the external and internal cleanup that we must do in our submission to God. This is just Old Testament imagery. Again, the practice of ritual cleansing and purifying when we are in the presence of God, it means that we clean up what we're doing and how we're thinking. And what's in our heart, what our desire is, what we seek. So he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then he gives this grouping of several imperatives in verse 9. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And this is a, a group of commands that really mean to just be serious about our sin. These aren't commands to be just a generally like miserable and gloomy person. That's not what he's talking about here. James is calling his readers essentially to make a public display of their repentance because that's what cleansing your hands and purify your hearts is. It's repentance. It's, it's turning from what you were doing, how you were thinking, the desires that you had, and turning towards God. And so that shouldn't just be a mental thing. That shouldn't just be anything that you skip over. That shouldn't just be a, a verbal claim. That should be something that your whole person takes on. And so get serious. We can't make excuses. We can't overlook anything. We mourn. We weep over our sin and the pride that we have exhibited in the face of God. We don't just move on. We seek to humble ourselves before God in a genuine submission to him because genuine submission to God and humility cannot take place unless our hearts are fully in it. It's not enough to just say, I'll stop doing that. It's not enough to just think, well, I need to get better at that. Repentance is a full 180 degree turn and it requires all of our heart, all of our being in order to truly submit. And so lastly, he says in verse 10 then, humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. James concludes his list with the priority attitude in the entire process. Humility is the answer to the conflict that you're experiencing and that James addresses all throughout his letter, including disunity in the church. People who are humble do not seek 
their own rights, their own privileges, their own leadership and authority, or their own desired outcomes for the relationships that they have. They allow God to exalt them. They seek to be humble. And without humility, a relationship with God cannot be maintained. And a community like this one will crumble. So I remind you of our main idea from this morning. That lives ravaged by conflict are lives resistant to God. We have to see the deeper issue at hand behind our conflict with each other. Typically, our solution is, well, I just need to make amends, or I just need to get past it, or maybe I just need to sever that relationship or sever that friendship. And we go to what we naturally think is the source of the problem. We think it's out here. But the interesting that James does in this passage is that he takes that horizontal conflict, those horizontal quarrels and fights and wars and conflict that's happening with other people, and he flips it to be a vertical problem. It is a problem not with those out there. It is a problem between your heart and God that you're not submitted to him. You are being resistant to him. So therefore, in in fixing the vertical problem, we will also be fixing the horizontal problem. Because again, we don't have time for it, but that's where James goes in verse 11 and 12. And he talks about how we speak to each other then, after we've submitted to God, after we've humbled ourselves before God. So how's your life going? What conflict is ravaging your life or maybe is just brewing in your life and you see it coming? How are you and your spouse? Teens and kids? How are you and your parents? How are you and your siblings? Parents, how are you and your kids? Believers, how are you and others in our church doing? How are you and friends that you have doing? Are you looking out the window for the source of your problems or are you willing to look in the mirror first and examine your own self? How's your relationship with God doing? Because conflict in any area with other people any area of your relationships can be traced back to your resistance to God in some fashion. Maybe holding on to bitterness. That's an issue with God. You may be ignorant of your own manipulation. That's a problem with God. You may be hurling insults back and forth to each other or complaining about this person or whatever that they did. That's not an issue between you and, that's an issue between you and God. These are conflicts in your life because your passions are out of control and you are not humbling yourself before God. So just imagine with me, if we walked into our relationships every day, armed and dangerous with this truth. If we walked into our workplace with this truth. If we walked into our families clinging to this truth, our marriages could look so different from those around us. Our families could be living peaceably with each other. Our workplaces would be affected. Our church would be built up to be a refuge of love and unity and stability that would attract people curious to understand what is going on here. But brothers and sisters, this can only take place if you, you personally, look to submit and humble yourself before God first.